Bonjour, Jean-Paul. Hey, come va? Tutto bene? Tutto a posto? Bene. No? We are starting. Thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Well, I just want to warm, warmly welcome everyone, all the participants. Thank you to the co-organizers, uh, the uh, IPA uh, CIS, uh, the PACE, uh, PAM, and UNOCP for convening this international uh, parliamentary conference alongside ourselves. Thank you very much to Valentina Matvinenko. She took the initiative the first time in 2017. I was there in St. Petersburg. I heard her speech today, so thank you very much also for the role that the Russian Federation is playing into this uh, conference. I'd like to commend uh, my colleagues from PAM, uh, Gennaro uh, Migliore and Sergio Piazzi. And Sergio, thank you very much for moderating the event uh, after my initial remarks. And also, I would like to underscore how important is our partnership in this endeavor. Um, I'd like to underline that there are 50 MPs from 30 participating states uh, of the RSC who have registered for this event, and uh, this shows the great interest that we have in the Parliamentary Assembly. And uh, in particular, I would like to indeed uh, commend the um, uh, IPA CIS, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the CIS countries, uh, for this initiative. Uh, in 2017, we had the first event. It was very much participated in St. Petersburg. I really hope that uh, the next one will not be with this kind of uh, technical means, but will be in person in St. Petersburg again. Uh, but this also underscores the very important uh, contribution that the Russian Federation plays in the global fight against terrorism. Uh, as I've often said, only playing as one team, we can truly protect uh, the terrorists, the citizens from uh, terrorists. Um, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, as you know, since uh, the annual session in Minsk in 2017, has established a, a committee on the fight against terrorism, which is led by uh, Reynold Lopatka, MP from Austria. You heard him in the main session this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Reynold, for your leadership of this uh, committee. And thank you also to the vice chairs, Bono. Uh, Van Dom and uh, Richard Hudson from the United States. Um, I would like to also play uh, a special word of uh, appreciation for the work uh, that uh, Nikolai Rizak, the Russian member uh, in our committee, is playing uh, uh, in the OSC Parliamentary Assembly. This is also a sign of the confidence uh, building role that uh, the Anti Terrorism Committee has uh, within our assembly. And if you allow me also to play, to pay a special tribute to um, Nikolai Kovalov, uh, the late Kovalov, who actually triggered the uh, initial idea of constituting a, a, a terrorism committee within the Parliamentary Assembly. He played an important role in our assembly. He was the first special representative on the fight against terrorism and understood that it was necessary to deal not only with a one-man show, but more with a committee, as we have established. Um, the, um, as you know, terrorism poses a direct threat to the security of all countries. And uh, gatherings such as uh, this uh, meeting are critical to keep uh, our political focus right on target. Uh, open dialogue and timely exchanges of information between states remains critical. And uh, I'd like to underline how important it is to work uh, both bilaterally, but also multilaterally, as we're doing in this conference, including through parliamentary assemblies. And thank you also to all the other parliamentary assemblies involved into this, uh, into this effort. Uh, um, we have often said that, of course, uh, many of the countries participating in this event have disagreements on the international arena, but that on uh, this particular issue, they come together in the fight against uh, terrorism. And uh, we should always try to put aside our internal uh, uh, and, let's say, national divisions when we fight uh, an, a global threat like the one of terrorism. Uh, if you uh, allow me, this is um, one of these... Uh, uh, in these cases where cooperation and collaboration is not only the uh, most uh, uh, good thing to do, the, the, the wise thing to do, it's actually the most convenient thing to do. I think that uh, collaborating and cooperating on the fight against terrorism is actually the smart thing to do, not only the good thing to do. So I leave you with that thought, and I hope that uh, 
this uh, very good uh, cooperation that we have established among our assemblies and among our institutions will continue. And uh, I wish you all a very good session. And uh, Sergio, thank you very much for taking the lead from here. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you to, to Roberto for, for the introduction. I, I fully share what he said, and it's really that by joining efforts and uh, also using a common methodology in uh, facing the terrorist threat, we can be successful. No one is immune, no one can act alone, and the parliamentarians have a key role in making sure that law enforcement of our countries have the appropriate tool to fight the terrorism in accordance with the rule of the law and to ensure international cooperation, which is the key to success. Said so, I would like to welcome all of you to the second session of this important parliamentary conference, which is dedicated to assessing the terrorist threats and effort to prevent violent extremism. This is extremely important and this one specific aspect of the joint effort to contain and fight terrorism on which parliamentarians have the key tool. Let me start this session with the panel which is a very senior panel, and I wish to thank all those who have accepted to be on it. And I have now the pleasure to invite to take the floor Honorable Gennaro Migliore from Italy, who is the chair of the PAM Special Committee on Counterterrorism. And uh, dear Gennaro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, all <clears throat> excellencies, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure for Pam to co-facilitate this joint session together, OC, OSCPA, our key partner of counterterrorism, and to share with you some perspective in my capacity, uh, as uh, Sergio Piazzi said, uh, as the chair of the PAM Special uh, Committee on Counterterrorism. <clears throat> PAM has been monitoring key trends on terrorism uh, over the recent months and the last February. PAM held a joint meeting with the, the UN Office uh, on Counterterrorism uh, dedicated uh, to the challenges of the post territorial ISIL uh, context. In this regard, it's my pleasure to brief uh, on you some of the key outcomes of uh, our debates and recommendation for parliamentarians to consider in addressing three key priorities, which are the ISIL survival in Syria and Iraq, the threat of the terrorist recidivism, and the surge of terrorist activities in Africa. The first challenge is that uh, thousands of ISIL members including fighters, or women and children, remain in battlefield detention uh, in Syria and Iraq without a comprehensive solution. Many of these are foreign nationals who originate from the countries represented in this conference. It's clear that battlefield detention can only be a temporary measure, and it is uh, not a sustainable option as today it represents uh, a humanitarian crisis and tomorrow it will be a security threat. If the status quo persists, uh, terrorists will network among each other and become even more dangerous while innocent people will, uh, became, uh, will become radicalized. Moreover, this condition will indeed serve as a breeding ground for the next generation of ISIL supporters, as many children are faced with the war-related trauma, persistent radicalization, and the issue of statelessness. There is a real danger that ISIL survivors uh, will eventually be released from battlefield detention, and they will find their way back to countries of origin and pose a new and even more dangerous terrorist threat. For this reason, 
states must comply with international law in line with the UN Security Council uh, resolutions, which mandate that states must bring terrorists to justice and uh, ensure appropriate prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration of foreign fighters uh, and their accompanying family members. Parliamentarians must continue to engage in constructive dialogue at the national level to explore viable options to address the status of their national health in the former ISIL territories. This important outcome of the last PEM debate was also highlighted by the US Department of Justice in a recent major, uh, major publication. Second, there is a threat posed by terrorist recidivism. Currently, there are thousands of convicted terrorists serving their sentences in our region. For example, in the EU, the average terrorist-related sentences is uh, five or six years. This means that a large number of the convicts will be cleared from release in a very near future. The recent attacks in London and Vienna perpetrated by convicted terrorists who had been just released serve as an alarm for us to consider dealing with this threat. Pam has called on our member parliaments to address possible existing legislative gaps that may increase the risk of recidivism and to ensure that such measures are in full compliance with the national constitutional norms and the human rights obligation. Moreover, we have to examine the, examine the effectiveness of the de-radicalization programs. Sharing of best practices among our countries can help us identify effective models. Our research shows that initiatives that seem to work better tend to integrate diverse sectors in a holistic approach. Third, but not least, PAM has been observing an alarming trend of increased terrorist activities in, uh, <clears throat> on the African continent. Particularly, there are the shocking rates of terrorist activity in Western Sahel region, Lake Chad uh, Basin, East Africa, and Mozambique. This represents a danger that will have a global implication as the condition in these areas may serve as an opportunity for terrorist organization to establish a foothold from which they may organize and export terror throughout the world, as we have previously seen with the so-called Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. PEM is convinced that international efforts to promote security in uh, the affected parts of Africa must also address the root causes of violence and instability, including a persistent lack of development, environmental degradation, lack of opportunities for youth, arms proliferation, exploitation of local conflicts by global terrorist actors, governance vacuums, and diminishing trust in state institutions. PAM has been working closely with NATO, the UN, and the World Bank to promote a comprehensive security and development strategy for this region. And we look forward to further expanding international cooperation on these matters, starting from, of course, OSCPA. Dear colleagues, I look forward to the debate and to hearing your perspective through our dialogue. We can synchronize our priorities to reinforce the key role of parliaments in the global fight against terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Migliore. Uh, very interesting, an excellent per perspective. And you have touched upon some of the, the key elements which national and international parliament must consider in order to contrast the threat posed by the terrorist groups and the violent extremism parts of our societies. And particularly, we have, I really appreciate the emphasis that you put on what is happening 
in Africa in this moment, in the larger context and the impact on our regions. It is now my great pleasure to present to you and invite to take the floor, Honorable Aude Bono Dorm from France, the Deputy Chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Counterterrorism of the OECA Parliamentary Assembly. Honorable Bono Van Dorm, the floor is yours. Merci infiniment. Monsieur le Secrétaire Général de l'APM, Madame l'Ambassadrice, Monsieur le Président du Comité spécial de l'APM sur la lutte contre le terrorisme, Monsieur le Représentant de la Direction exécutive du Comité contre le terrorisme des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Chef de la politique et de la recherche de Tech Against Terrorism, chers collègues parlementaires, c'est un grand honneur pour moi d'avoir l'opportunité de pouvoir m'exprimer devant vous aujourd'hui au sein de ce forum prestigieux. Je tiens à remercier l'APOSCE et l'APM de m'avoir convié à cette conférence et plus particulièrement à cette session. Je représente ici l'APOSCE, qui est une organisation régionale de sécurité unique en son genre, conçue pour créer un élan politique en vue d'une action concertée de Vancouver à Vladivostok grâce à l'élaboration de politiques au contrôle réciproque et à l'implication de ses 323 membres. Elle a créé en son sein un comité de lutte contre le terrorisme afin que ce fléau reçoive une attention et un traitement spécifique. Je tiens ici à féliciter son président, Reynold Lopaka, pour son leadership et sa détermination à apporter une contribution parlementaire unique à la lutte mondiale contre le terrorisme, notamment en établissant des partenariats avec l'ONU, l'APM et d'autres intervenants clés. Le comité de lutte contre le terrorisme de l'APOSCE a effectué de nombreuses visites sur le terrain et contribué à de nombreux événements dans l'espoir d'apporter une réelle plus-value dans ce domaine. Le thème de votre session aujourd'hui, évaluation de la menace terroriste et des efforts pour prévenir l'extrémisme violent, annonce un débat politique intéressant et malheureusement très actuel. Le terrorisme est un défi complexe qui ne connaît pas de frontières et nécessite une approche globale au niveau local, national et international. Et la lutte contre la propagation des idéologies extrémistes en ligne constitue aujourd'hui un élément essentiel de la prévention du terrorisme et de la lutte contre la radicalisation en général. Même si les progrès technologiques rapides sont d'une utilité indéniable, les groupes terroristes ont tôt compris qu'ils pouvaient les utiliser pour radicaliser et recruter les membres les plus vulnérables de nos sociétés. La pandémie de Covid-19, si elle a conduit à limiter les possibilités de voyage, a offert de nouvelles opportunités pour diffuser la propagande terroriste dans le monde via entier, via Internet. Internet est désormais un outil privilégié pour appeler à commettre des attaques terroristes, les glorifier, accroître les opérations, les opérations de recrutement, stigmatiser les minorités et surtout diffuser des informations fausses et discriminatoires. L'isolement dû notamment au confinement et la peur accroissent la vulnérabilité humaine et créent des terrains fertiles de désinformation ou de fausses informations qui peuvent cibler des groupes sociaux précis et encourager les crimes haineux violents. En tant que Française, je suis bien placée pour vous en parler. C'est à cause d'Internet, de sa liberté totale et de l'impunité des hébergeurs des réseaux sociaux qu'un professeur, Samuel Paty, a été sauvagement décapité l'année dernière en France, en plein jour, devant son collège. Internet a été le vecteur de haine contre cet homme qui ne faisait que son travail, informer ses élèves sur les libertés de conscience et d'expression et leur donner des outils pour qu'ils puissent être des citoyens éclairés. Ce sont les appels aux crimes publiés sur les réseaux sociaux qui ont incité l'auteur de ce meurtre à passer à l'acte. S'il est admis qu'il faut faire davantage pour empêcher l'utilisation d'Internet à des fins terroristes, il n'y a toujours pas de consensus international sur la réglementation d'Internet, qu'il s'agisse de normes contraignantes ou d'autorégulation. 
le rôle des forums interparlementaires tels que l'AP ou SCE et l'APM est extrêmement important dans ce contexte, car il contribue à trouver un, ré, un tel consensus. Il est impératif de mieux réglementer Internet et l'espace numérique, ainsi que le rôle des médias sociaux dans la prévention de la violence et du terrorisme. C'est la raison pour laquelle l'Union européenne a élaboré le Digital Services Act. Il vise à renforcer le contrôle des contenus publiés sur Internet et la protection des internautes. Il reviendra à chaque État membre de l'Union européenne de le transcrire en droit interne le plus vite possible. J'invite également les États qui ne font pas partie de l'Union européenne à adopter des législations comparables afin de construire un environnement juridique mondial sans faille ni refuge pour les terroristes. Il nous faut nous doter de politiques efficaces pour combler les lacunes des cadres nationaux de lutte contre le terrorisme et élaborer des stratégies ciblées pour répondre au cyberterrorisme. La France, profondément meurtrie par le meurtre barbare de Samuel Paty, porte une importance particulière aux nouvelles obligations contenues dans le DSA. Nous avons donc déjà introduit deux de ces dispositions majeures dans une loi actuellement débattue au Parlement. La première renforce la lutte contre les sites miroirs d'un site déjà bloqué sur décision judiciaire. Cela signifie qu'une autorité administrative pourra demander le blocage d'accès ou le déférencement d'un site dont le contenu est identique ou équivalent à celui d'un site visé par une décision judiciaire. Le projet de loi prévoit également une série d'obligations et de moyens à la charge des réseaux sociaux et des moteurs de recherche afin de prévenir et lutter contre les contenus illicites les plus attentatoires à la dignité humaine. Ces obligations seront imposées aux opérateurs, qu'ils soient établis ou non sur le territoire français, preuve de la détermination du gouvernement français. Les plateformes de médias sociaux sont dès lors de plus en plus appelées à déterminer elles-mêmes quel contenu est légal ou non. Toutefois, le manque de définition juridique précise rend cette tâche très, très compliquée. Par ailleurs, il ne faut pas être naïf, la suppression de contenus illégaux par les grandes plateformes de médias sociaux et les fournisseurs d'accès Internet pousse les terroristes et les extrémistes vers des plateformes plus petites, moins contrôlées et moins bien pourvues financièrement. En 2018, dans sa résolution de Berlin, la POSCE soulignait la nécessité d'agir en coopération, y compris avec les entreprises technologiques et les médias sociaux pour élaborer et mettre en œuvre des mesures pratiques visant à contrer l'exploitation d'Internet et d'autres technologies de l'information et de la communication à des fins terroristes, notamment pour commettre, inciter, recruter, financer ou planifier des actes terroristes. Je ne peux qu'appeler à une coopération internationale et multidisciplinaire accrue dans ce domaine, notamment en échangeant des informations entre les forces de sécurité, la justice, le secteur privé et les ONG. Dans un tel contexte de lutte contre le terrorisme et l'extrémisme violent, il faut également protéger les droits de l'homme et l'état de droit, tout en luttant contre la menace terroriste en ligne. Il est délicat de trouver le juste équilibre entre la liberté d'expression et la suppression de contenus dangereux en ligne. Il s'agit de concilier les libertés individuelles et la lutte contre le terrorisme. Pour cela, comment ne pas rappeler le rôle central des parlementaires pour opérer cette conciliation et contrôler l'application des normes par les pouvoirs publics et les acteurs privés C'est à vous, c'est à nous, de veiller au respect des valeurs démocratiques et de promouvoir des réponses antiterroristes conformes aux droits de l'homme. La POSCE continuera de travailler sur ce domaine complexe notamment en établissant des partenariats avec des entités publiques et privées pour appuyer le travail des parlementaires. Je vous souhaite, je nous souhaite, un débat fructueux et je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Madame Bono Van Dorm, for your statement. You highlighted 
many, many important points, the social media, the freedom of speech, and the common action in containing terrorism. Thank you very much for, for your intervention. Now, moving on, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Alena Kupcina from Belarusia, and she's the OIC coordinator of activities to address transnational threats. Please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, Excellencies, distinguished members of the parliamentary institutions assembled here today, dear colleagues. Let me first thank the organizers for inviting the Transnational Threats Department of the OEC Secretariat to attend this very important international parliamentary conference. It is my real honor and privilege to be here today with you. Let me start by emphasizing a few points of particular importance to the OSC, but also in reflection of the points raised earlier by other colleagues, also in the plenary session. So preventive efforts against radicalization to violence require strong partnering with civil society. Countering terrorism jointly with the private sector and on different levels is another layer of partnerships that should be incrementally strengthened and addressing rehabilitation and reintegration aspects of violent extremism offenders through a multi-stakeholder approach. It is only through effective partnerships and cooperation at all possible levels that we will be able to mitigate these challenges in a sustainable way which was also the main outcome of the OSC 2020 Counterterrorism Conference under the Albanian OSC chairpersonship. Next week, we will be building on these recommendations when convening for this year's OSC-wide Counterterrorism Conference under the Swedish chair. Let me give you a couple of more specific examples why the topics I highlighted matter. And let me show you at the same time what the OSC in Vienna and in the field is doing about these issues. On preventing radicalization to violence, both on and offline, the COVID-19 pandemic has locked people away, often leading to extended screen time, also for those vulnerable to violent extremism propaganda. Moreover, during such times of uncertainty, conspiracy theories are eagerly amplified by violent extremists, aiming at exacerbating the situation further. Strengthening the capacity of civil society actors is key to help countering the violent extremist rhetoric. The OEC's initiative on leaders against intolerance and violent extremism, LIFE, is doing exactly this, and we are proud to have started working with Central Asian participating states on strengthening the capacity of civil society in this regard. While building media literacy and countering violent extremist uh, messaging with alternative, positive narratives is one important pillar, we also need to cooperate with the IT industry and wider online community in developing sensible parameters to take down violent extremist content. A recent webinar organized by my transnational uh, threats department featuring the OSC representative on freedom of the media and various other experts led to a set of recommendations that will be promote, uh, will promote, uh, we will promote in future related activities. Among those efforts on countering the use of the internet for terrorist purposes, there are tabletop exercises which are aimed at strengthening the collaboration between relevant government entities, the IT providers and other stakeholders. Moreover, jointly with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the OSC is promoting international cooperation in the gathering and sharing of electronic evidence in line with international human rights standards. Prevention also requires preparedness by security services and the business community, especially when critical infrastructure or soft targets are in question. In order to assist these different stakeholders in coordinating responses to terrorist threats, the OSC is preparing a regional event in Central Asia this year, joining forces with UNOCT, 
CITAD and Interpol in this endeavor. Moreover, the OSC continues to implement projects on strengthening travel document security as a way to address cross-border travel of foreign terrorist fighters. We are supporting participating states to establish advanced passenger information systems and joining e-passport public key directory, thereby fostering cooperation between national authorities, the airline industry, and the International Civil Aviation Organization. Last but not least, another preventive effort is in the direction of drying out the funding that terror organizations need for their operations, often generated through links between terrorism and organized crime. The OEC is cooperating with UNODC in a multi-year project on countering the financing of terrorism. In addition, this important topic will be discussed at an upcoming regional conference we will organize together with the government of Turkmenistan in May. The invitation, invitation package has just been sent out this week, and I'm inviting respective experts to register. Having touched upon the topics uh, of prevention and different areas of countering uh, terrorist activity, let me now turn very briefly to the issue of rehabilitation and reintegration. Several OEC participating states in Central Asia and Southeastern Europe have taken commendable efforts in uh, repatriating their nationals from the conflict zones in Syria and Iraq. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, or Bosnia-Herzegovina, to name a few, have gathered experiences and developed good practices that could help other states that are still hesitating to repatriate their citizens. To help promoting these good practices, events focusing on age and gender sensitive responses, responses to women and children will be organized by my department jointly with the OEC field operations in Central Asia. Further activities promoting international legal cooperation in terrorism cases, as well as on assistance for parliamentarians working on preventing and countering terrorism and violent extremism are planned. And we are looking forward to partnering with the OSC uh, Parliamentary Assembly's Ad Hoc Committee on Counterterrorism in this endeavor. I'm looking forward to further discussing where the OSC could be of assistance, and we are very open to hear your ideas, suggestions, and requests. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm passing the screen back to you, distinguished Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Ambassador, Ambassador, thank you very much for your very interesting intervention. And I think Pam will revert to you for the future. Thank you very much. I have now the pleasure uh, to give the floor to Mr. Jacob Bertenson, who is the head of policy and research at the Tech Against Terrorism uh, Institution and is from Sweden. Mr. Bertson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I have a presentation to share, so let me just try and get it up on the screen now. I hope that you can all see this. Do let me know if you can't. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to the organizers of this event for inviting us. Um, I would also like to thank uh, my fellow co-panelists for their very insightful remarks. Uh, and I look forward to uh, discussing a bit more about the work that we do at Tech Against Terrorism. So. To introduce ourselves, um, my name is Jacob. I'm head of policy and research at Tech Against Terrorism. Tech Against Terrorism is a public-private partnership um, working with the global tech industry to uh, improve the response to terrorist use of the internet in a way that respects human rights. We work closely uh, with uh, the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. And uh, we are delighted that we have once again uh, had an opportunity to uh, contribute to a fruitful partnership with the OSCE and the UNOCT in this, on this very important topic. Uh, today, uh, I will touch on three um, overarching topics. First, I will um, discuss some of the trends that we are seeing with regards to terrorist use of the internet. Secondly, I will discuss our support program for the tech sector. And thirdly, I will discuss some of the recommendations that we have for policymakers and parliamentarians working on this topic. 
So starting off, I think it's important to stress, and I, I really appreciate my, my panelists' contributions and remarks on this issue, that uh, terrorist use of the internet is, is, a, is a key um, part of modern terrorism um, and is, of course, a, a big threat. It's also, also important to emphasize that terrorist groups use a, a large amount of diverse um, online platforms and predominantly smaller tech platforms to recruit fundraise and spread propaganda across the internet. So this is a problem that, yes, affects large social media platforms, but it also goes a lot, uh, it goes far beyond Facebook and YouTube. So uh, we do see that terrorist mm -hmm. groups um, use social media uh, for uh, sharing propaganda, uh, but they also use file sharing platforms and content storage platforms. I think it's also important to uh, emphasize the fact that terrorists use a lot of online platforms for operational purposes. This includes using end-to-end -end encrypted messaging and financial technology uh, platforms. I would also like to highlight two trends that we have seen re re recently. The first one is around what we call terrorist-operated websites. These are websites that terrorist groups themselves build on web hosting software and registering them to DNS registrar companies. Um, we see uh, these websites playing an increasingly important role in the online terrorist information ecosystem. So we believe that this is a threat that should be uh, taken very seriously. Having said that, there are several technical, legal, and human rights challenges to taking action on such websites. Secondly, um, we are very concerned about the rise of uh, an increased use of uh, decentralized platforms. These platforms are built in such a way that it is very difficult to do any type of content removal on, on these platforms. And we encourage uh, policymakers and parliamentarians to, to um, inform themselves more about this topic, uh, for example, by reaching out to us or, or other experts, because we believe that this is a, a trend that will increase in the future. And there's a note to make about this generally around the uh, adversarial shift uh, with regards to terrorist use of the internet. Terrorists, uh, knows, terrorists know exactly what they're doing when they're using online platforms. And there's often a very specific and good reason as to why they use specific uh, platforms or whether they choose to migrate to a new platform, for example. This might have to do with uh, things like specific feature sets on any given platforms, or for example, uh, large content removal uh, uh, campaigns on platforms which displace the threat. So in, to that end, uh, I do think that we collectively need to improve uh, risk assessments and anticipate uh, rapid shifts going forward. And to illustrate um, how the content dissemination pattern often works um, as, as we understand it, um, um, as you can see here, um, there are four overarching categories of platforms used by, by terrorist groups when sharing propaganda. The first one are beacon platforms. And this is where, uh, this is, these are platforms that um, terrorists operate as channels through which they cascade uh, URLs and links to other platforms, uh, which we have detailed under content stores. These platforms are almost always small file sharing platforms. Some are run by, um, a, by only one person, and they get thousands, or if not, uh, if not more, of links from groups like ISIS uh, and others coming in every day. So it's very difficult for these platforms to moderate content. Um, these links are then hosted on uh, third-party aggregators, which might include traditional or conventional social media platforms, but also terrorist-operated websites. Fourthly, uh, terrorist groups make effective use of simple circumventing tools uh, to uh, circumvent content moderation efforts on behalf of the larger tech companies. And this uh, is a pattern that we often see in routine um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda um, propaganda dissemination. But we also saw this exact pattern um, in the Christchurch attack with the attack video and the manifesto that was shared. So to speak briefly about the work that we do at Tech Against Terrorism, um, our work is, separate, uh, is divided into these four overarching categories that you can see on the screen. We spend a lot of time doing in-depth open source intelligence research and analysis to identify uh, platforms at risk. Uh, we do bespoke 
uh, research for tech companies to help them better understand the threat they face. We also run a, a mentorship program where we support companies in improving their policies, their content standards, their content moderation practices, and transparency reporting. Lastly, we also build uh, products and technology uh, to support tech companies in improving the response uh, to this threat in a way that respects human rights. One example includes the terrorist content analytics platform, or TCAP, which is a verified a, a database of verified terrorist content, which alerts tech platforms as soon as we discover terrorist material on their sites. And this project is funded by Public Safety Canada. Another platform is the knowledge sharing platform, which is a platform that centralizes educational materials and tools to support companies in building capacity to respond to terrorist use of their platforms. Lastly, um, I just want to touch on some of the recommendations that we make to, uh, to policymakers and parliamentarians. With regards to mitigation strategies, we think that it's very important that, that policymakers focus on providing strategic leadership in, in this area. That includes investing in, in threat awareness mechanisms, for example, open source intelligence, um, and also uh, helping to anticipate that adversarial shift that I was talking about before. It's also important that policymakers consider the uh, wider online ecosystem and particularly smaller platforms and not only focus on the largest ones. We also encourage policymakers to provide clarity on key terms, for example, via designation practices and increase uh, and clarify the legal basis with which um, that, that would motivate content removal, for example. And of course, we encourage policymakers to focus on the offline root causes of terrorism as well in a way that respects human rights. With regards to regulatory approaches, um, we encourage policymakers to consider regulatory incentives through a human, human rights, transparency and accountability lens and to avoid measures that are likely to lead to censorship of legal material. We also encourage policymakers to avoid introducing measures that, that risk pun punishing smaller tech platforms uh, for, having, for not having enough capacity to respond to legal requirements, for example, short removal deadlines. We also want to ensure that uh, regulation does not contribute to extra legal norm setting or enforcement, and that any regulation is anchored in the rule of law. And lastly, uh, that uh, we avoid extraterritorial enforcement of national law, and as my French colleague mentioned, promote more global regulatory consensus on this matter. So I believe that is my time, uh, but I'd be more than happy to take questions and do feel free to, to contact me if you have any questions about any of the points that I've made. Mm -hmm. uh, now hand it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bertson. Very, very interesting. And I see your presentation and that from the honorable member from France really move in the same direction and this extremely extremely relevant for our, the work ahead of us, ahead of all of us. Now, for the, before I introduce the next speaker, who is Honorable Derar Belul Al-Falasi from the delegation to BAM from the United Arab Emirates, we will watch a short video that he has prepared, which is very touchy, is a, a short version of a longer video, uh, very strong, but which repeat thousand of words. And to after the video, he will complement with the, some reflection the issue of children in uh, detention camps or in area of conflict. Can we show the video, please? لماذا لا تريد ان تحدث الي
hacer mucho ¿sí? Thank you very much. I think that this video is very clear and is only a drop of what is happening in, in the reality in the, in the field. I have the pleasure now to give the floor to our colleague, Honorable Al Falasi from the United Arab Emirates. There are, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I wish everybody in the beginning to, to look at the video. Uh, I think, uh, so you have it completely, about five minutes and uh, it will be my honor to answer all the questions. Uh, you might excuse me, I will speak in Arabic. You know. I say that was sad. I want to feel the day. I want to have السيدات والسادة الكرام يواجه العالم ونسيم منطقتنا العربية الكثير من المخاطر بسبب آخر الإعمار التي صارت الكثير من الدول والسلم ليس في المنطقة وحسب إنما على المستوى العالمي كما أن طبيعة الإرهاب أصبحت مستقرة وأن معظم الجرائم المتعلقة به هي عابرة للحدود مع ملاحظة تزايد استخدام الجماعات الإرهابية في الإنترنت ووسائل التواصل الاجتماعي من تجديد المطالعين خاصة الأطفال والشباب مما يشكل تحديا عالميا لا بد من تضافر الجهود في مواجهة وبسبب الإرهاب أضحت منطقة الشرق الأوسط حرضا حرضا للمنظمات الإرهابية التي لا Yeah. 
تقع الفقر يجعلهم يتعلقون باي امل للخلاص من فقرهم ناهيك عن ان الفقر يسهل ايضا نقص كبير في مستويات التعليم على سبيل المثال يعمل تنظيم داعش الارهابي الى استغلال الاطفال يذكر فيديوهات دعائية ضمن سلسلة ما يسمى وفي هذا الإطار أود الإشارة إلى المبادرة الوطنية والإقليمية والدولية التي اتخذتها دولة الإمارات في مجال مكافحة الإرهاب والتطرف ومن أهمها واحد صدرت دولة الإمارات العديد من التشريعات المعنية بمكافحة الإرهاب والتطرف العليم، وقد كان المجلس الوطني الاتحادي دورا هاما في صياغتها، ومنها قانون الاتحادي لعام 2014 الجاري بشأن مكافحة الجرائم الإرهابية، ومرسوم بقانون يقضي بتجريم الأفعال المرتبطة بإقراء الأديان المقدسات، ومكافحة كافة أشكال التمييز، وتجريم التمييز بين الافراد والجماعات على اساس الدين والارض والمذهب والمله والطائفه واللون والاحرار ومكافحه استقبال الدين لتفكيك الافراد والجماعات. اثنين على المستوى المؤسساتي تم تاسيس مركز صواب وهو مبادره تفاعليه بالشراكة مع الولايات المتحدة للتصدي للمعايير التي تطلقها الجماعات المتطرفة الأخرى عبر الشبكة الإنسانية تعزيز البرامج الإيجابية ويأتي المركز ضمن إطار تعزيز جهود التحالف الدولي لمحاربة الإرهاب كما أسست الدولة مركز هداية الدولي للتمييز في مكافحة الإرهاب العنيف يقوم المؤسسة الدولية الأولى لإعداد البحوث في مجال مكافحة التصرف بكافة مظاهره وأشكاله ولدعم الجهود الدولية. ثلاثة كما صدقت دولة الإمارات على 14 اتفاقية دولية حتى الآن متعلقة بمكافحة الإرهاب وشاركت الدولة في تحالفات جماعية في مجال محاربة الإرهاب والتطرف مثل التحالف الاسلامي العسكري لمحاربه الارهاب والتحالف العربي والتحالف الدولي ضد داعش ودعم المؤسسات الدينيه الوسطيه مثل الازهر الشريف. وكون البرلمانات تمتلك صلاحيات تشريعيه ورقابيه يمكن للبرلمان الحث من الاثار السلبيه لمكافحه الارهاب. من خلال العمل على ضمان المواضيع المتعلقه بالتنميه الاقتصاديه والاجتماعيه والسياسيه على راس اولويات الحكومه وميزانياتها في مقابل الميزانيات الامنيه المخصصه لمكافحه الارهاب. واخيرا نقترح عدد من التوصيات التاليه التي من شانها المساهمه في الحد من الاثار السلبيه لتجنيد الاطفال من قبل الجماعات الارهابيه وهي اولا البرلمانات والمؤسسات الاقليميه والدوليه للتسريع في مثيره المشاورات الخاصه بالاتفاق على مفهوم دولي شامل للارهاب حيث نتعرف وجود مفهوم يحدد الاعمال الارهابيه وعدم الوقوف هذا يجعل العالم عاجزا امام تنوع الارهاب واساليبه. ثانيا دعوة البرلمانات لتفعيل دورها في الحد من الاثار السلبيه في مكافحه الارهاب من خلال العمل على ضمان بقاء المواضيع المتعلقه بالتنميه الاقتصاديه والسياسيه على راس اولويات الحكومه وميزانياتها في مقابل الميزانيات الامنيه المخصصه لمكافحه الارهاب. ثالثا لما كانت اغلبيه الدول التي انخرط مواطنيها المنظمات الارهابيه لا ترغب في استقبال رعاياها نرى اهميه دعم المنظمات التي تعمل على اعاده تاهيل الاطفال المجندين في الجماعات الارهابيه لتفعيل 
the children of Nadam Rayat and Alamiya, I will communicate. وجهوهم الساعية إلى عادة الاندماج في المجتمع مما يفيد للأطفال العودة إلى المجتمع بشكل طبيعي نشكركم على استمتعكم Thank you very much, Honorable Al-Falasi, for your intervention and, and for the video. I wish really to thank you and to continue to work with you on, on this topic. Now, I would like to, to open the parliamentary debate. Uh, I have a list of people who have already registered with us or raised the hand to, to take the floor. Uh, for those who wish to take also to be added to the list, I will ask them to raise the hand on your screen. Uh, I would be grateful for all speakers to, uh, to limit their intervention to three minutes because we have a long list. And I would like maybe also the member of the panel to comment at the end if we have the time. I would also recall to all those who have requested the floor that the intervention must be related to the topic of our discussion, counterterrorism. I will now the I will read the first four names in the list so that you can get ready. The first is Herbal Lapatka from OCPA, then Ambassador Jean Paul Laborde. Then Honorable Arzun Ajiev from IPACIS Azerbaijan. And then Mr. Vladimir Lukin. This is the first group. Then I will continue. Honorable Lopatka, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, as the chair uh, of the OEC, the ad hoc committee on countering terrorism and violent extremism, I would also like uh, to welcome everyone and uh, a special uh, thank you to Cenaro and uh, Bam for co-hosting this uh, event. And I have to say thank you to my colleagues like Art for their active engagement in our fight against terrorism. I wish to commend uh, the panelists for their thought-provoking uh, presentations and add only uh, a few personal considerations. First, foreign terrorist fighters continue to pose complex security challenges to many of our countries. While some, for, some uh, foreign terrorist fighters have returned home and face uh, uh, prosecution, as Gennaro mentioned it, many more are stranded in Syria and in Iraq. The situation in northeastern Syria is particularly a dire where thousands of people with suspected links uh, to ISIL and other terrorist groups have been held in overcrowded camps. Last December, I was there in two of these camps, uh, in al Hol and in al Roch. Especially in al Roch, uh, we have many European citizens there, women with their children. And I think, uh, really, we should not forget uh, um, uh, the situation as it is there. It is awful, and especially the Kurdish administration in this region, they need international support because they have a lack of resources, uh, and um, if there is no international help, then it gets worse. But on the other hand, also, and we have the situation in, in our countries. We have to address the rise of intolerance, polarization, and conspiracy and extremist movements, uh, which is going hand in hand with this health crisis. Right wing uh, networks increasingly promote uh, social polarization, intolerance, especially on social media. I see it in my country. And, and here our uh, fight against the violent extremism, against hate speech, uh, is of utmost importance. Uh, 
Uh, and what we need is effective legislation, successful cooperation of intelligence services, and of course, better engagement of civil society and also religious communities play here an important role, saying this during the time of Ramadan. Summing up, I think that well-planned and coordinated international responses in countries like Syria, and especially in this part of northeast of uh, Syria and the, in the part of Kamishli uh, and where uh, these camps in al Rosh and in al Hol or uh, where this big uh, prison is in al Hasaka. Uh, here, uh, we should not forget uh, the people um, there, but they need uh, our support. And we have to do at the same time uh, everything uh, we, we, we can do uh, for prevention and de-radicalization here uh, in Europe. Thank you for your attention. And I think meetings like this are really very important. And I have also to thank the host. Thank you. Honorable Lobakta, thank you very much. And thank you again also for the excellent work you are doing and for the mission you carried out, which is really witnessing with the foreign Western eyes, what is going on there. And, and, and your report is really taken very, very seriously by, by all of us. I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Ambassador Jean-Paul Laborde, who is the senior advisor to PAM on counterterrorism. Jean-Paul. Thank you very much, Secretary General. And uh, thank to you for for all your efforts that you made for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of conferences. And uh, thank you always also to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, other organizations here, especially uh, the other partners, uh, and especially for the uh, uh, the two other uh, parliament uh, which are. Um, so uh, I agree. I am very sympathetic to the uh, to what uh, Honorable Lopatka said uh, just before me. But uh, and and I, I fully agree with all what uh, what has been uh, underlined in his speech. Uh, however, there is also another uh, aspect of. Uh, Counterterrorism, which uh, uh, shall never be uh, forgotten, uh, in the context of global challenges and threats, uh, and, and, and especially against uh, terrorism and violent extremism, the challenge is, uh, is, the, uh, the, is, con is the, the links between. Uh, Transnational organized crime and terrorism. And I think that uh, this is a, one of the most challenging uh, issues uh, that we have to face. Uh, we should stress that uh, on the ground, the situation has evolved in a way that these links uh, have become more and more dangerous and more and more. Uh, I would like to say uh, the magnitude is more and more important. If I refer to um, if I refer to the word atlas of illicit flows, uh, which was issued two uh, years ago by Interpol, uh, the Norwegian uh, Institute of uh, uh, Institute also, which was also uh, jointly. Uh, issued by RIPTO of Norway and the Global Initiative Against Organized Crime. Uh, it should be said that collectively from for seven main extremist groups of insurgents and terrorists, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, FARC, FARC, uh, Islamic State and the Taliban, uh, plus the DRC fighters combined funding total uh, is about 
it's about one to one point three nine billion dollars a year per year. So it means that uh, what is diffused and fueled in the in the terrorist organizations and which also promote extra, uh, violent extremism, all the funding uh, is uh, really uh, uh, not all. The the main part of the funding is connected to connected to uh, to organized crime. Something that we have to address. And uh, uh, this is something that the uh, uh, parliamentary organizations have to address. Uh, uh, because very often we we, um, uh, we tackle terrorism and non extremists on one side, and uh, on the other side, we address the issue of, of uh, transnational organization. No. No, uh, we have to look at the uh, two phenomena which are not similar. It has to be recognized. Which are not similar, but we have to look at them together, especially now with uh, the, the, the cyber crime. And cyber crime is one of the facets, one of the aspects of uh, uh, organized crime. So it means that with uh, the parliament and the parliamentary organization, which my organization, the Parliamentary Assembly of Mediterranean, we should really address the, this issue uh, in order to tackle, um, uh, tackle uh, terrorism and violent extremism in a, in a comprehensive way. And with our uh, actions, we could also, of course, we have also, also uh, to involve, we have also to involve uh, civil society, media, because all these uh, uh, very strong actions have also to be uh, uh, undertaken and undertaken in the, in the complete compliance with the rule of law and human rights. Thank you very much for your understanding. And, uh, many, and for your attention. Many, many thanks, Jean-Paul, many thanks. And now I give the floor to Honorable Arzu Najiev from IPACIS Azerbaijan. Спасибо большое. Я Арзу Нагиев, представляю парламент Азербайджана, являюсь депутатом Азербайджанского парламента. И я благодарю за организацию такой конференции. Я потому что являюсь членом Милимеджиса Азербайджанской республики по обороне, безопасности и борьбе с коррупцией. Кроме того, член комитета Медли Мяджлиса по труду и социальной политике. Очень, уважаемые участники, очень интересно было слушать весь процесс доклады специалистов в этой области. И можно сделать такой вывод, что достижение успеха в борьбе с экстремизмом и терроризмом невозможно без понимания его причин и условий возникновения. И то, что я представляю Азербайджан и Южный Кавказ в том числе, эти регионы являются наиболее пострадавшим от террактов. Что означает насильственный экстремизм и радикализм? Термин радикализация в основном используется для того, чтобы объяснить, каким образом человек становится террористом или насильственным экстремистом. Точнее, и насильственный экстремизм, и экстремизм, и радикализация – это, по сути, дополняющие друг друга понятия. Известно, что противостоять насильственному экстремизму и терроризму – это очень сложная задача. И на международном уровне то же самое. Потому что в обоих случаях ставятся конкретные цели и задачи. Напугать людей, осуществлять террористические акты, 
Здесь самое главное навести страх, столкнуть людей различных культур, религий, религий этнических принадлежностей. И это, к сожалению, удается и сегодня тоже. Вот представьте себе, сколько говорят о террористических группировках, постоянно называются так называемые радикальные мусульманской организации. Кроме того, есть и другие 13-14 организаций радикальных, которые в мире существуют. Их тоже достаточно. Здесь я бы хотел для выявления причин методов борьбы, естественно, требуются совместные, согласованные условия и действия. Надо осуществлять комплексные меры пересечения, потому что терроризм сочетается и с организованной преступностью, оборотом оружия, торговля наркотиками, людьми. Естественно, надо учитывать источник финансирования и факторы коррупции. В связи с новыми технологиями, темпы развития техники появляются новые виды терроризма кибернетического, радиационного, информационного. Рассмотрим классические виды террористических актов. Естественно, здесь появляются различные виды. Я согласен с коллегами, вот то, что из Объединенных Арабских Эмиратов, к сожалению, часто используются и дети в этом вопросе. Вербовки в основном осуществляются через социальные сети. Кроме того, террористы, чтобы достичь цель, могут применять и другие методы, как, такие как ядерный терроризм, то есть использование терроризма в качестве оружия, радиоактивных материалов, использование химического оружия, биологических средств и прочих. И в этом случае основной целью является заражение местности, заражение атмосферы и воды, затопление при разрушении плотин, организация массовых пожаров путем поджога лесов, распространение эпидемии. Мы столкнулись с этим в примере при освобождении оккупированных территорий со стороны Армении. В 44-дневной войне мы поняли, что, что означает международный терроризм и как их используют. Вот представьте себе радикальные крыла некоторых партий, которые можно назвать именами АСАЛА и ПКК, другие. Можно сказать, что полностью они были переброшены в оккупированные территории. Когда говорят о разрушениях, сегодня уже представители всех посольств, которые находились в Азербайджане и были в этих местах после разрушения, во что превратили, можно сказать, эти места. Нет ни одного нормального здания, которое можно посмотреть. Все мечети, их и свои, как сказать, религиозные культуры. Полностью это все разрушено. Кроме того, подвергли Азербайджан и эти места экологическому террору. Представьте себе, после подписания 10 ноября, чтобы покидали территории боевики и другие, они поджигали дома, поджигали все здания. Кроме того, постоянно пугали разрушить плотин некоторых водохранилищ. Хотели и несколько раз попытались и обстреляли ракетами Мингичаурскую гидроэлектрическую станцию. Кроме того, международные трубопроводы БП консорциума, который проходит через Тауский район, вот, откуда я представлен депутатом, представьте себе, они хотели именно э, разрушить все эти э, международные трубопроводы консорциума. То есть я еще раз хочу отметить, что никто не рождается террористом, экстремистом, насильником. Они осаждаются, подписываются уже потом. Основным вопросом является как они этим становятся, вербовка исполнителей. Это осуществляется виртуальным методом, через интернет, находят потенциальных кандидатов, учитывая его все возможности, психологические, материальные, моральные качества и состояния, религиозные взгляды, этнические принадлежности. Понятно, что бороться с международным терроризмом и экстремизмом в одиночке очень трудно, почти невозможно. Можно привести антитеррористической операции и прочее. Но сотрудничество и взаимодействие между различными структурами необходимы. Необходим обмен информацией, потому что помочь в этом могут и помочь аналитические центры. Должны приниматься законы. Нельзя в одностороннем порядке подойти двояко. То есть кто-то друг, кто-то враг. Если есть террор, если есть терроризм, надо прямо 
разрушать э, при рождении. Мы должны принимать решения закону по выявлению, предупреждению и предотвращению, пресечению проявлений, естественно, учитывая права человека. Проведением массовой агитации, пропагандой надо начинать со школьной скамьи, в интернете, в социальных сетях, открывать новые рабочие места для трудовой занятости, рассмотрение и расширение прав и возможностей, естественно, женщин. Вот представьте себе, еще раз я вернусь к этим событиям. После подписания трехсловного соглашения 10 ноября некоторые группировки с армянской стороны перебросили, чтобы создать террористический анклав именно в освобожденных территориях. А после того, как провели антитеррористическую операцию и арестовали их, и по всем статьям, и по военным преступлениям, по пересечению границы уже возбуждено уголовное дело. Сегодня армянская страна пытается всему миру объяснить, что это является военнопленные. Они не военнопленные, они сегодня как преступники будут перед судом отвечать за свои содействия. То есть нельзя обманывать мировое сообщество. Я думаю, что одним словом, сотрудничество и взаимодействие, обмен информацией должны проводиться постоянно. И на международном, и на местном уровне, чтобы спасти людей, человеческого будущего поколения. Спасибо за внимание. Еще раз я благодарю и парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ, и межпарламентской ассамблеи СНГ за такую конференцию. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much, Honorable Najef. Now I have in the list the first Mr. Vladimir Lukin, IPACI's expert. He will be followed by Honorable Stefanos Stefanu from Cyprus. And after that, Honorable Aik Konjorian from OICPA Armenia, and then from Honorable Kamil Aydin from OICPA Turkey. Mr. Lukin, the floor is yours, please. Спасибо. Меня слышно, я надеюсь. Благодарю господина Пьяци за предоставленную возможность выступить. Я согласен со многими тезисами выступивших до меня, господ ученых. И хотел бы обратить внимание уважаемой аудитории на то, что Организация Объединенных Наций фиксирует в среднем за год до 30 военных конфликтов. Причем, как подтверждает исследование Международной кризисной группы, они становятся более кровопролитными после вмешательства иностранных государств, осуществляемых якобы с целью прекращения конфликтов или борьбы с терроризмом. Но как боролась международная коалиция из более чем 50 стран с исландским государством на Ближнем Востоке широко известно. Пока не объединились усилия и других стран, до этого вот эта территория ГЭР расширялась несколько раз, и теракты даже были перенесены на европейскую территорию. У нас заявлена тема конференции с учетом пандемии COVID-19. Так вот, в условиях этой пандемии, на наш взгляд, ситуация по борьбе с терроризмом усугубилась. Особенно это касается беднейших стран на планете, помощь которым, если оказывается, то символического характера. Хотя страны западные, ну и европейские продекларировали, что будет оказываться помощь таким странам на сумму до 100 миллиардов долларов США в год. Но ситуация экономическая сложная сейчас и, и в странах развитых в экономическом плане. И вот э, проявляется это, например, в реальном противостоянии по поводу распределения вакцин в этих странах. Ну а в ряде стран конфликты все чаще возникают из-за ресурсов. Можно перечислить даже вот африканские несколько стран, Сахель, Сомали, Нигер, где часто возникают конфликты между земледельцами и пастухами из-за ресурсов. 
воспользовавшись пандемией, активизировал свою деятельность исламское государство. По данным газеты New York Times, у них сегодня до 18 тысяч бойцов. Только в Иране их от 2 до 3 тысяч, они активны. Это и спящие ячейки, так называемые, и ударные группы, которые готовы убивать и похищать. А по оценкам Контррессийского комитета Совбеза Организации Объединенных Наций, адаптируются, консолидируются силы и создают условия для возможного возрождения. Сейчас, по некоторым сведениям, исламским государством руководит Абу Ибрагим Аль-Курайши, чье реальное имя пока точно неизвестно, хотя в прессе уже звучала фамилия, имя Амира Мохаммеда Абдулрахмана Аль-Маули Аль-Сальби, который участвовал в геноциде народа езидов. Продолжаются атаки в Ираке и Сирии. <coughs> Благодаря открытой границе между ними идет перестройка финансовых сетей, вербовка новых членов, о которых тут некоторые выступающие уже говорили. И особенно активизировалась работает на территории Сирийской Арабской Республики в палаточном городке Аль-Аль-Холь. Собственно, осуществляются дерзкие нападения даже на нефтяную инфраструктуру. В Сирии члены ИГ действуют на контролируемым режимом Асада территории от города Хомс центре вплоть до городов Дер-Эрзор на, восток, на востоке, на границе с Ираком. Именно Аль-Холь стал новым центром пропаганды исламского государства. И было несложно сделать это, потому что многие 70 тысяч жителей, семьи бойцов этой организации и те, кто покинул поле боя. Ну и вот Соединенные Штаты Америки, например, считают, что это произошло из-за невозможности создать минимальную безопасность со стороны курских сил. После, почему я на этом обратил в сюжете такое внимание, потому что после начала пандемии количество операций возросло до 20 в месяц, а до этого было одна. Ну и напомним еще об африканской ветви Аль-Каиды или исламского государства. Это группировка Аш-Шаббат в Сомали контролирует центр и юг, почти треть страны уже провозглашены создания Пунтленда и Джун, Джунбаленда. А в Азии Афганистан по-прежнему остается серьезной проблемой, где борьба с терроризмом не утихает уже который год. Мы можем вспомнить также заявление Байдена президента США об уходе американских войск оттуда в мае по договоренности с Талибаном, о чем Джан Поль тут говорил. И это может вообще спровоцировать активную фазу гражданской войны в Афганистане, в которую превратится вот эти террористические акции. Ну и здесь важный момент, что у нас доминирующий глобальный политический актор США подошли к неконтролируемому, по сути, внутриполитическому кризису впервые в современной истории. Перед уходом с поста, вспомним, Дональд Трамп даже подверг сомнению легитимность избирательной системы своей страны. Ну и я как житель России не могу не сказать о том, что гражданин России, любящий нашу любимую отчизну, что Западный Альянс все активнее и громче бряцает оружием у нашей границ, сопровождает свои действия одновременно обвинения в агрессивных намерениях нашего государства. Вплоть до того, что у них вызывает протест перемещение наших частей подразделений на, по, по, по территории России, тогда возникает вопрос, а что делают американцы и европейцы на границах с, нашей, с нашим государством? Возникает вопрос и задумываешься о государственном терроризме. Вообще, вот с точки зрения здравого смысла, в современном мире происходят удивительные вещи. Я не знаю, как вот, например, нас, наш господин модератор, видел ли он сюжеты, как президент Украины Зеленский вместе с американцами бегал там по линии соприкосновения противостоящих сил в Донбассе. Для меня, например, как человека, понимающий, что там происходит, выглядит это очень странно. Зеленский, с одной стороны, заявляет, что Донбасс – это украинская территория. 
как поезжает ты как президент на эту территорию и добивайся мира. А он там бегает и прячется якобы от каких-то пуль. Ну и завершая свое выступление, я хотел бы сказать, что главная причина неудач в борьбе с терроризмом, на наш взгляд, заключается в отсутствии единого подхода в глобальном масштабе к определению сути и содержания терроризма. Каждая страна трактует это по-своему, и с точки зрения одной, одного государства, например, это террористы, да, а с другой стороны, это вот борцы за свободу и независимость. Ну, яркий пример вот предыдущее выступление представителя Азербайджана. И действительно, вот с их точки зрения, люди, которые сейчас задержаны, наверное, их задержали во время совершения вот таких актов, которые можно подвести под определение терроризма. С точки зрения армянского, наверное, будущего выступления, он по-другому это трактует. И вот пока не будет единого понимания, что такое терроризм, успеха не будет. И сколько бы мы ни говорили о том, какие меры там можно принять, какие формы, методы, они ни к чему реальному не приведут, к сожалению. Вот на этой пессимистической ноте я и свое выступление хотел бы закончить. И еще раз благодарю всех участников, которые выступают с очень интересными сообщениями, докладами. И, безусловно, то, что есть позитивно в их выступлениях, мы обязательно будем использовать в своей работе. Благодарю вас, господин модератор, и всех остальных. Спасибо вам и всего вам доброго. And uh, now, uh, before I give the floor to Honorable Stefanos Stefanu from uh, Cyprus, I we have less than 30 minutes, so I would really ask you to limit your intervention to three minutes. Otherwise, it will not be possible for everyone to take the floor. I have a long list and all very important points of view. Uh, Honorable Stefano, Stefano, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, my colleagues. Uh, regards from uh, the Cyprus capital town, Nicosia. My intervention is a short one. I believe that uh, in three minutes' time I will uh, read it. So, there is no doubt that the international community must reject and confront terrorism. Terrorism undermines, opposes, and abolishes principles and values which humanity has created and upon which the continuation of human civilization bases itself on. Terrorism constitutes a direct threat and is an opponent of peace, cooperation, and solidarity, which must exist between states and peoples. Terrorism is responsible for the carnage of victims and that is precisely why the international community must join its forces to confront it. The fight against terrorism to date has not been particularly successful, despite all the relevant declarations, repeated statements, and expressions of uh, determination from powerful countries. And this is the case for some important reasons. First, in many cases, the fight against terrorism has been instrumentalized and become an alibi for invasions, military interventions, and numerous states or for unacceptable interferences in the internal affairs of countries aimed not at combating terrorism, but at strengthening positions on the chessboard of regional and global domination. This unacceptable approach fuels and strengthens terrorism instead of fighting and suppressing it. Second, terrorism is fueled by unacceptable practices of covert cooperation and funding of extreme and fanatical forces for the overthrow of lawfully elected governments. Terrorism is not tackled by state terrorism, which make is, makes it stronger. Third, in many cases, the competing of terrorism 
which abolishes international law and nullifies the principles and values of modern civilization is done in violation of international law by excluding diplomacy and collective action on the part of the international community. Terrorism must be uh, competed in ways and uh, means that do not harm democracy, freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. For the war on terror has not prospect of success unless the international community's actions are decisive in eradicating the socioeconomic conditions which give rise to and reproduce terrorism, unless it does not decisively, decisively combat inequality, poverty, and put an end to neocolonial policies, unless a just and democratic system of international relations and the collective action of the international community against terrorism prevails. The issue of tackling inequality and poverty becomes even more relevant in the period of the pandemic. The pandemic is causing an economic crisis, upheavals in health and welfare systems, the loss of millions of jobs, confinement, and immense uh, psychological stress. If poor countries are not helped by the richest to cope with the pandemic's socioeconomic consequences, if societies are not supported to address the collapse of their health and welfare systems, if access to universal vaccination is not guaranteed, the economic health and social crisis and the current situation of the inequality and poverty will be exacerbated. And as we have already said, this situation is the best breeding ground of terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor for three minutes to Honorable Aik Konjorian from OICPA Armenia. The floor is yours, please. Спасибо. Уважаемые коллеги, пандемия коронавируса стала большим вызовом, представляющей собой серьезную проблему для здравоохранения, социальной, экономической, гуманитарной и во многих других областях по всему миру. После вспышки коронавируса практически все страны мира сосредоточились на преодолении пандемии и устранении ее последствий. Однако ряд, ряд ранее существовавших проблем э, не перестали быть актуальными, а в некоторых случаях эти проблемы обострились. Терроризм, как глобальная угроза, продолжает представлять опасность всему человечеству. К сожалению, пандемия стала новой возможностью для некоторых террористических групп и их сторонников действовать более активно, вести античеловеческую преступную деятельность. В 2020 году Армения и армянский народ столкнулись с серьезным вызовом после того, как Азербайджан начал военную агрессию против Нагорного Карабаха в разгар эпидемии коронавируса. Несмотря на призывы международного сообщества и лидеров стран сопредседателей низкой группы ОБСЕ, Азербайджан продолжил свои беспрецедентные военные агрессии против Арцаха и армянского народа используя многочисленные, неприемлемые и бесчеловеческие средства. Такие действия, которые типичны для террористических организаций, такие как обезглавление, бесчеловечные пытки и издевательства над жертвами. Официальные заявления разных стран и ряда международных СМИ подтвердили, что Азербайджан при поддержке Турции перебросил в регион международных террористов для проведения военных операций в Нагорном Карабахе. Есть много неоспоримых фактов, подтверждающих это. Есть еще факты, что даже после окончания войны эти террористы продолжают оставаться в регионе, создавая реальную угрозу не только для Армении, но и для других стран региона. Уважаемые коллеги, согласно заявлению о прекращении огна, огня, подписанного 9 ноября 2020 года, должен был начаться обмен военнопленными, заложниками и другими удерживаемыми лицами и телами погибших. К сожалению, Азербайджан до сих пор отказывается возвращать армянских военнопленных. Это грубое нарушение заявления от 9 ноября. Сегодня 
Азербайджан стремится искажать реальность, политизирует вопрос военнопленных, нарушая свои международные обязательства. Кроме того, Азербайджан продолжает агрессивную риторику и антиармянскую политику на высшем уровне. Несколько дней назад в Баку открылся так называемый парк военных трофеев. Церемония открытия парка и выступления там президента Азербайджана свидетельствует о том, что эта акция направлена на публичное унижение памяти погибших на войне, пропавших без вести, военнопленных, попрание прав и достоинства их семей. Это еще раз доказывает, что Азербайджан не отказывается от агрессивной антиальмянской риторики, которая представляет собой реальную угрозу безопасности, безопасности регион регионального мира. Уважаемые коллеги, терроризм, насильственный экстремизм и агрессия являются вызовом всему миру. Поэтому мы должны объединить все наши усилия для предотвращения, распространения и поддержки терроризма различными группами и странами. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have in the list, uh, and I will give the floor one by one to Turkey, Syria, Tunisia, and Cyprus for three minutes. Therefore, now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Kamil Aydin from OICPA Turkey. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. The chair, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes loud yes. and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I would like to express my appreciation for this valuable parliamentary conference which works to address global challenges and threats of terrorism. Terrorism remains as a key threat to international peace and security. This scourge does not re recognize borders and affects states irrespective of their geographical location. Our long and painful struggle against terrorism has led us to learn that this scourge cannot be defeated by high security measures alone. For sustainable solutions, there is an absolute need to counter the spread of radical ideologies, leading individuals to embrace violence of terrorism. The COVID-19 pandemic did not deter terrorist groups from seeking new ways to operate and continue their activities. Terrorist organizations continue to spread their hateful narratives, recruit youth, and claim innocent lives via internet and social media. We should be more responsive and innovative in the face of evolving nature of modus operandi of terrorist organizations. Turkey has been subject to terrorism and struggling against many types of terrorist organizations for decades. This is the reason why Turkey has been advocating the need for international cooperation for a long time through bilateral and multilateral platforms. Encountering violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorism, the main challenge rests on gaining hearts and the minds of those in the risk groups. Unfortunately, social and economic consequences of the pandemic have compounded and adverse conditions of vulnerable groups. We should develop better mechanisms to tackle problems of vulnerable groups to combat violent extremism and radicalization. At the global scale, we see terrorist, terrorists using and abusing religion and religious symbols for an ideological cover. Having said that, it would be a mistake to associate any religion with terrorism. Such rhetoric would only be, become a toll for terrorist groups to expand their sphere of influence. Yet, Muslims and migrants are among the primary targets of radicals and extremists. To, to, put, to, put, to put in perspective, only the Turkish community living abroad has been targeted more than 20, 250 times by these groups Sorry, you know, there is an interference, I think. Sorry, sorry, there is an interference with the, somebody else taking the floor. Shall I start from the last paragraph onwards? Yes? It was only the, the last uh, 30 seconds. If you can start again from 30 seconds ago. Thank you very much. Well, it's not my mistake, Chair. 
it I know, I know, I know. Yes. It, it, it was something technical. Yes. Please, go ahead. Yet, Muslims and migrants are among the primary targets of radicals and extremists. To put it in a perspective, only the Turkish community living abroad has been targeted more than 250 times by these groups since the beginning of 2020. Some of these attacks caused loss of lives. I frankly believe that our spirit of unity will be helpful to find a long lasting peace in our region. In order to fulfill this, we have to strip of our biases and prejudices and concentrate on combating, you know, terrorism in general. Otherwise, if we focus on, you know, our biases and prejudices, we cannot take any step, we cannot take any solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your intervention. Now I have the pleasure to give the floor to the delegation of Syria. Please, the floor is yours. Three minutes. The Syrian delegation is ready. ويشرفني أن نكون معكم في هذا الملتقى الهام جدا إن الإرهاب من أهم الآفات الاجتماعية على كل المجتمعات وخلال تأثيره على الأمن أولا وعلى الاقتصاد ثانيا وهناك دول حاضنة للإرهاب أدخلته إلى دول مختلفة وصدرت كثير من الإرهابيين إلى بلاد سوريا وهذه الدول قد تعدت ال وتمادت في أعمالها لنزيد لوحدة الأراضي السورية وإن العوامل التي تدفع إلى التطرف العنيف متعددة وضمن صنف ضمن صنفين هامين هما الدفع وعوامل الجزم وإن الحصار الاقتصادي أو ما يسمى بقانون قيصر على بلادي كان له تأثير سلبي على الوضع المعيشي والصحي من خلال مواجهة جائحة كورونا التي خطرها كما هو الإرهاب حيث قام الإرهابيون بسرقة الموارد الأساسية لبلادنا والمعامل بشكل عام ومن خلال مشاهدة الفيلم الذي عرض قبل قليل كيف عمل الإرهاب بالأطفال والنساء هؤلاء الإرهابيين الذين دخلوا بجماعات إرهابية متطرفة مدربة واستطاع ضم عدد من الأفراد من أفراد بلادي طوعا أو تحت الضغط والترغيب والدليل على ذلك أن تحرير الجزء الأكبر من مناطق بلادي من الإرهابيين عاد جزء كبير إلى حضن الوطن ما نتمناه أن تكون هناك ملاحقة قضائية فعالة عالمية لهؤلاء الإرهابيين المتسترين بالغطاء الديني وهو منهم بري والذي نمته بعض دول الجوار وكذلك سن سياسات وقوانين صارمة في وجه الإرهاب ولا بد من تعزيز الحوار الوطني بهدف منع الاستقطاب الاجتماعي وظهور الإيديولوجية المتطرفة ولا بد من مواجهة استخدام الانترنت والتكنولوجيا الناشئة عنه والتي تمول وتخطط وتخطط للأنشطة الإرهابية نحن في سوريا أدفع الفاتورة الأكبر عن الدول العربية والإسلامية علما أننا كنا من أكثر الدول الدول استقرارا من جميع جوانب الحياة المعيشية والأمنية وهذا ما عملت عليه بعض الدول لخلخلة الأمن في سوريا ولكن سنعود سنعود ويعود الأمن والأمان إلى سوريا ويعود اقتصادنا كما كان من خلال وعي شعبنا الذي بدأ ينبذ الإرهابيين في أغلب المواقع أشكركم على هذه الندوة الهامة التي يحتاجها العالم بشكل كبير في هذه الظروف وشكري على إتاحتي بالحديث عن تأثير الإرهاب على اقتصاد وأمن بلادي ونأمل من البرلمانات بشكل عام المطالبة 
بوقف تمويل الارهاب وفك الحصار الاقتصادي عن بلدنا الذي من اكثر عشرة سنوات نعاني ونعاني من الارهاب بكل انواعه. اشكركم واشكر جميع البرلمانيين المشاركين في هذا الملتقى الهام واشكر من قام على تنظيم هذه هذا الملتقى وشكرا. Thank you to you very much. Now I give the floor for three minutes to Honorable Kensa Jali from Tunisia. The floor is yours, please. Shukran. Yes, yes, we oui, sabah, madam. Shukran. شكرا لكم بداية استسمحكم العذرة في رداءة الصوت لإصابة فيروس كورونا وأرجو عذري قليلا في الوقت على الحديث بسرعة شكرا لجميع المتدخلين في مزيد البحث والنقاش Sorry, sorry. Excusez-moi, madame. Madame, excusez-moi. Madame, on n'arrive pas à vous entendre. On n'arrive pas à vous entendre, madame. Oui, ça va. Merci. Elle إن العمل الجماعي والتعاون الدولي مطلوبان الآن أكثر من أي وقت مضى من خلال مزيد تعزيز أدوات متابعة الاستخبار المتابعة الاستخباراتية ودعم في مجموعة من الاتفاقيات للتنسيق الأمني على المستوى الإقليمي والدولي وتطوير أساليب التتبع الأمني خاصة وأن مرتكبي العمليات الإرهابية قد طوروا من أساليب عملهم سواء من حيث مصادر التمويل أو من حيث استخدامهم لمختلف التطبيقات التكنولوجية والذكاء الاصطناعي ضرورة اعتماد مقاربة شمولية ترتكز إضافة إلى المجهودات الأمنية على البرامج الاقتصادية والاجتماعية والثقافية والتعليمية والإعلامية والسياسية من خلال خطة مشتركة لغاية مكافحة الإرهاب إن النجاح الاقتصادي من ثاني قضاء على الفقر ومشكلة البطالة وحياة التوازن بين المناطق المهمشة وبقية المناطق مما يكون في تلفيق الخاضنة الرئيسية للإرهاب إن سياسة تونس في مكافحة الإرهاب والعنف تعتبر ناجحة لأن ثوابت الدولة التونسية تقوم على الالتزام بالحياد الإيجابي وعدم الاستفاق وراء المحاور المتصارعة والتورط في الصراعات التي يمكن لها أن تنعكس سلبا على الاستقرار في بلادنا وفي هذا الإعتبار هذه المقاربة إطار هذه المقاربة قام البرلمان بإصدار قوانين لمكافحة الإرهاب في إطار احترام حقوق الإنسان والحريات التي تضمنها بالسورة 2014 بالسورة الجمهورية الثانية كذلك قانون عدد 26 مارخ في 7 أوت 2015 المتعلق بمكافحة الإرهاب وغسل الأموال إضافة إلى تركيز اللجنة الوطنية لمكافحة الإرهاب وقد سجلنا في ذلك عديد النجاحات ولم نعد مفاجئ بالإرهابيين كما اعتمدت تونس مقاربة ثقافية وتربوية تشاركية تهم جميع الفئات من المواطن العادي والشباب والمرأة ومؤسسات الدولة والمجتمع المدني إضافة إلى المؤسسات الدينية والتربوية والأمنية والسياسية بنشر قيم شاملة وتطوير ثقافة الحوار وقبول الآخر والإحاطة النفسية والاجتماعية للضحايا أنفسهم. كما تقوم مقاربة تونسية في مقاومة الإرهاب والعنف على البعد الاقتصادي والعناية بالفئات الهشة والفقيرة. التي أثبتت الدراسات أن أغلب المنحرفين والإرهابيين هم من تلك الفئات التي يقع استدراجها ويغرأها ماديا. في الختام أود التأكيد على أن المبادئ التي يجب أن نتفق عليها جميعا هي أن الإرهاب لا دين له ولا وطن له ولا هوية له وهو عابر لكل ذلك. وفي هذا الإطار 
التعصب بكل نقط من الاطراف الدوليه والاقليميه دعمت تجربه الديمقراطيه في تونس لتحقيق مزيد من نجاحات الارهاب والعنف العابر للالفاظ والقرارات شكرا على حسن الاصغاء والسلام عليكم معذره مجددا على الرداء Thank you very much. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Honorable Kyriakos Ajayani from OICPA Cyprus. Honorable Kyriakos, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent opportunity to give me. And uh, against the backdrop of the current pandemic home crown of foreign terrorists and white extremists, Acting alone or in groups, and regardless of their ide ideology, have used excessively the internet and social media to disseminate propaganda, hate speech, and misinformation, and to radicalize potential recruits. As evidence shows, the exploitation of online gaming and social media platforms during this period of the pandemic may have also provided them with more access to younger people as they spend a significant amount of time away from school, thereby increasing concerns about their potential radicalization. Therefore, cooperation with online platforms to remove terrorist content the soon as possible must remain a priority. The pandemic has facilitated the subversive work of terrorists in a broader way as well, declining socioeconomic conditions the deepening of inequalities, extreme poverty and hunger, which are underlying factors that fuel terrorists and extremists have been exacerbated as a result of the pandemic. Terrorists and violent extremists seek ways to exploit the resulting resentment. Therefore, as parliamentarians, we must make sure that economic recovery is as inclusive as possible within our countries as well as across the OSC region. At the same time, human rights abuses and the increased sec securitization as a response to the pandemic also contribute to exacerbated conditions which are conductive to radicalization and violent extremism. In the OSC area, anti-extremist or anti-terrorism laws have been used all too often to to hunt down political opponents or even to silence critical journalists. In the same context of the current pandemic measures that excessively limit the fundamental freedoms of association, peaceful assembling and expression are plundantly being used as a pretext to cartel civil liberties. As members of parliaments, we must continue to provide the necessary checks and balance against the excessive use of restrictive measures. Additionally, our efforts to prevent radicalization and violence extremists must continue to focus also on education. Inclusive education can contribute to alleviating the danger of radicalization and violent extremism. Additionally, the promotion of interfaith dialogue and particularly the involvement of the youth in this dialogue in order to foster tolerance, mutual respect and social cohesion must be prioritized. I believe, therefore, that states must ensure proportional COVID-19 responses and adopt a balanced approach to preventing violence extremists with full respect to human rights and fundamental freedoms. As parliamentarians, we need to look into regulatory and legislative gaps and see how we can coordinate our efforts with other participating states as well as with other interparliamentary assemblies, such as PAM, in addressing inequalities in the post-pandemic world so that we can address the root causes of radicalization and violent extremism. Thank you very much. Honorable Kiriakos, many, many thanks for your intervention. Uh, and I give the floor now for three minutes to Senator Kovac Sirina from Romania. The floor is yours, please. Dear colleagues and friends, I would like to thank all the speakers for their thought-provoking interventions and to express the full commitment of the Romanian delegation 
to work closely with all stakeholders in order to constantly improve the efficiency of our legislative efforts to fight terrorism and to prevent violent extremism. The current crisis generated by the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly affected our societies in all aspects of human life. It is a test to our capacity of resilience and cooperation on a global scale. Although Romania has not been confronted directly with the terrorist threat, we are deeply involved in playing our role as members of the anti-Daesh ISIL coalition, and we shall continue to do so. Moreover, we do understand the potential strategic importance of the Black Sea and the Balkans as an alternative entry to the, to the EU, and we are committed to enact legislation accordingly. As our colleague from Interpol clearly described in the previous session, certain terrorist groups use the pandemic to reinforce their power and influence, particularly among local populations, and to expand their external financial resources. Because terrorists are well known to resourcefully use all social media tools for radicalization, recruitment, funding, planning, and execution of terror activities, the restrictions imposed by the pandemic have expanded the possibility to influence the public opinion faster. In this context, I truly believe that we, as members of parliament, should all work together in improving two essential components of our national legislation, education policies and the regulation of social media networks in order to promote tolerance, transparency, and to prevent fake news and radicalization. From this perspective, it is imperative that we collectively address in drafting our national normative frameworks to root the root causes of terrorism as matter of priority on multiple levels, social, economic, access to education, good governance, promotion of values of tolerance and respect. To conclude, I would like to thank the organizers and I am looking forward to working closely with all of you. Uh, in the end, I would like to invite my colleague, Mr. Senator Sebastian Czernik, to express his thoughts on the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you. Before Senator Czernik, I have a colleague from Azerbaijan. One moment. And uh, three minutes for Honorable Tural Ganjali from Azerbaijan, and then Senator Sebastian Czernik from Romania. Uh, Mr. Tural Ganjali, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear Mr. Chairman, colleagues. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this very interesting uh, conference, uh, timely conference addressing very important issues, uh, the challenges and uh, the security t terrorist challenges that we are facing. And of course, as the parliamentarians of uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and uh, members as the participating states of the OECPA, we have to play very important and very active role in spreading the information on preventing the uh, preventing the uh, security uh, challenges and posing uh, challenges to our region, to our countries. And of course, uh, uh, as a country, Azerbaijan has demonstrated. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, Azerbaijan has been very reliable and very constructive partner uh, within the Council of Europe as the participating state of the OECPA and have always supported the efforts of the international community fighting against terrorism. And of course, in these very difficult times when we are facing this COVID crisis, it's, uh, we have to redouble our efforts in order to, in order to uh, uh, face this problem and to address the challenges that uh, our countries uh, now are facing. And of course, uh, Azerbaijan has uh, seen 
the terrorist attacks and terrorist uh, challenges coming from Republic of Armenia uh, within uh, during the last 30 years. And even I, I can say that during the last uh, war, uh, which lasted 44 days, uh, the government of Armenia, its armed forces attacked and used ballistic missiles, ballistic rockets to attack the cities in Azerbaijan. And uh, the second biggest city in Azerbaijan, city of Ganja, was targeted with the ballistic missiles. And so many people were died and wounded. And of course, recently as a parliamentarian, while calling for peace, calling for the fight against terrorism, extremist, viol uh, violent extremism. Uh, I have received a message from the staff member of the Armenian parliament, which uh, openly in the social networks, her name is M M Ms. Lilith Gözelyan. She is a staff member of Armenian parliament. She called for beheading of me, uh, cutting of my head because of my peace messages. And I think that the, uh, the, as a member of um, you know, Council of Europe, we have to call uh, the leadership of the Council of Europe, the leadership of the OECPA, uh, to uh, bring uh, this uh, very, um, very disappointing, this disappointing issue into the agenda. Because as a staff member of the Armenian Parliament, she has no right to spread hate sp uh, speech and to uh, call to uh, behead uh, the member of Azerbaijani parliament, member of Azerbaijani parliament, uh, in this case, uh, myself. Of course, uh, I think that Armenian parliament, the government of Armenia has to take an uh, urgent issue and we call international community to pressure Armenia on this very challenging issues because we know that if not fight it, if not prevent it in time, this hate speech can lead to terrorist attacks, can lead to extra, uh, violent extremism. In this case, we are seeing the staff member of Armenian parliament. And of course, uh, during the last uh, 30 years, we have seen many consequences of these terrorist attacks in our region. Again, our main goal is now to uh, address all the problems with the cooperation, with the partnership of our uh, friends and allies in the region. The conflict is over. We have to look forward for the peaceful uh, resettlement, all remaining problems. And of course, Azerbaijan, uh, as a, again, reliable partner of the international community, after ending the war, uh, Azerbaijan uh, is now in the process of reintegrating all, all of Armenian ethnic um, uh, in the inhabitants in Karabakh as its citizens. And we would like to see a very bright future for uh, Armenians and our Azerbaijani citizens um, uh, in, in the Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, peacefully coexisting and uh, building our future together. But of course, uh, the hate speech, uh, Azerbaijanophobia, uh, calling for terrorism, extrem extremism uh, are not acceptable in our case. Thank you for, uh, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have the last speaker, and then we must close because the time is over. Is uh, Senator Sebastian Kernik from Romania. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. It will be a short message, no more than uh, than one minute. Uh, I would like to I would like to thank uh, Irina for uh, skillfully drafting our perspective on the topic. Uh, and uh, I would only like to remind our kind audience of the Romanian initiative to create an international court against terrorists based on three main values, international law, international justice, and international uh, rule of law. Every action undertaken by individual states and the international community must be based on law. And uh, the response to such a global threat as uh, terrorism is require uh, global action based on law. In this context, I generally believe that we need uh, concrete mechanisms, uh, new regional and global uh, legal tools to implement the international rule of law in the context of uh, fighting terrorists, especially in a post-COVID uh, era. However, cooperation is fundamental to ensure the success of our fight. We should focus on understanding violent extremism and uh, radicalization as a complex phenomenon that calls for an in-depth knowledge and multi-faceted uh, response that uh, does not have a single trigger or a single or uh, inevitable path. In the end, I do not want to finish my intervention without thanking uh, Ambassador Sergio Piatti for his uh, input and his uh, tirelessly contribution to the fight against terrorists. Thank you all and have a good day.
Thank you. Thank you to you very, very much. We have already passed the time. I wish to thank all those who have intervened. Uh, terrorism is a plague for all of us, for all our countries. There are differences, there are crises going on, even in between the countries who participate. Important is to sit around the same table and solve these differences with the peaceful mean that the international uh, community offers to us. Now, listen, the, this session is closed. In 25 minutes from now, the closing session will start. It is a Zoom session hosted by IPA CIS. It's a different Zoom link. You have the ID encode the numbers to reg to connect please be on time in 25 minutes i declare this session closed and i wish to thank all of you for your contribution thank you see you in 25 minutes thank you bye